Talia's Troubles, Part 76. The Second Assault on Campa Grotta. A Battle Report. The city of Campa Grotta, early autumn, 2403. The army of Carrick Borgo waited four days for their master engineer to declare it was safe to recommence firing Granite Breaker. The engineer spent that time scrutinising every square inch of the enormous barrel. No easy thing, considering its massive brass weight had to be lifted aloft by a hastily constructed hoist to a height of just more than the width of a dwarf, allowing him to crawl beneath, there to inspect the underside. As was the dwarven way, he was not to be rushed, taking his time to do the job thoroughly. Not one dwarf thought to complain, bar Glamourscale the wizard, who ought never to be taken as an exemplar of a typical dwarf. Brabant's own mercenaries, on the other hand, found the delay most frustrating. To them, the city seemed ripe for the taking. They had to console themselves with the notion that once the massive gun continued its booming battery, the enemy would be so distracted, distressed and dismembered that the mercenaries' casualties during the assault should be much less than otherwise they might. Meanwhile, the bombardment was maintained by the mighty engine's smaller counterparts. Cannons, bolt throwers and the archaically fashioned stone thrower the Brabants on had brought in pieces through the mountain pass, then pegged and lashed together with practice skill. Their combined efforts paled into insignificance compared to Granite Breaker's earlier work, but showed the enemy that the besiegers were awake and able to hurl missiles perfectly capable of breaking ogre's skulls and limbs, if not being very effective against the stone walls. The besiegers kept a constant, close eye upon the shattered walls and towers, expecting a sally would surely be launched against them. Apparently, however, the defenders had not the numbers for such ventures. Either that, or they were awaiting some other development. In the meantime, despite the steady barrage of bolt and ball, the surviving ogres patrolled the walls with their own brass and iron pieces, with smouldering slow match always to hand. Some brutes seemingly careless of whatever could be thrown at them, patrolled the mounds of rubble where the walls had tumbled. Others even wandered outside the walls. Perhaps curiosity had got the better of them, or they wanted to flaunt their contempt of the dwarves and men dispersed about the city. While most of these recrossed the rubble to return inside, several never went back, instead adding new, similarly grey heaps to the already large mounds of tumbled stones. When their hired Brabanzon scouts returned in the afternoon of the fourth day, the army of Carrick Borgo learned exactly why the ogres were biding their time. The riders reported the approach of not one, but two separate relief forces, from the north and the southeast. It was not all bad news, however, for the riders had seen no sign whatsoever of Rasgurt Boldergut's double army, only the two smaller contingents. An hour later... When the master engineer was finally satisfied, and not a moment sooner, the reloading of Granite Breaker began, and the great thane of Dravaz, Lord Narhak, ordered the call to arms. The army drew up in a rather different manner than their last assault, for they knew the foe could come at them from up to three sides. The dwarves formed a defensive arc of all their artillery pieces. The scouts had reported greater numbers approaching from the southeast so Lord Nahak joined his warriors to form a barrier to that side, while his thunderers and long-beard veterans stood upon his flank, along the front of the line. Beyond them, closer to the centre of the line, were the dwarven quarrelers, then the cannon and bolt-throwers, with Granite Breaker behind, able to shoot over the rest. Upon the right of the line were the mercenary Bretonians, the brabants -on, their main regiment of foot soldiers providing a solid corps, while longbowmen, and brigand archers formed close by to sting any who approached from that side. The Brabanzan horsemen, now reconstituted into one body, patrolled ahead of the line. Baron Garroy and his youthful knights rode upon the far right, hoping to be the first to engage any foe approaching from that flank. Having lost several of their number during the first assault, merely attempting to cross the rubble of the breaches, they were now hoping to engage the foe on the flat, for that would mean either glory through victory or defeat in combat, and not the ignominy of death due to nothing more than a fall. The defenders clustered mainly behind the southern walls before the dwarven line. The slaughtermaster Wergrut joined the newly recruited man-eaters, 
behind one of the few stretches of the wall that had yet to tumble, while one of the two surviving companies of lead belchers awaited, even further within, for orders concerning where and when to move up. The other lead belchers had mounted the southern wall, where, being entirely unable even to see the attackers, they too awaited orders. Wergrut, second in command, another slaughtermaster, skulked with the last of the bulls behind the ruinous gate. Such were the dispositions as the second assault was to begin. As Sergeant Huguet led his riders towards the wall to get a closer and better look at what appeared to be an undefended stretch, the ogres took the bold manoeuvre as a sign that the battle was about to commence. The lead belchers on the southern wall, having ladders ready on the ramparts, descended outside the walls and crept as best they could whilst hefting their heavy metal burdens towards the corner tower. The remainder of the garrison merely shuffled and stretched to peek out through the ruins here and there. One of the man-eaters, his ridiculously oversized head ornament, as well as the semi-collapsed ruins obscuring his view, had spotted the horsemen closing on the walls, but then quickly lost sight of them. He shouted across to Wergrut's magical lieutenant farther along the wall, who responded by conjuring up the spell known as Brain Gobbler to work a fearful doubt into their minds. Sergeant Hugay's angry shouts, laced as they were with more than a hint of the panic the ogre's enchantment had sent speckling through him also, failed either to reassure or cow his men, and the riders turned and fled. This initial discouragement, however, had little effect on the rest of the Brabanzon, for most simply assumed the riders had seen whatever they had seen and then chosen to fall back to a safer distance. When the horsemen did indeed rally and reform, this seemed only to confirm the mistaken assumption. Amongst the riders, it was the veteran Everart who spoke first. That was magic, lads. Nasty and peculiar. None of us is hurt, so let's put it behind us. If that's all they have, then it's a good thing, not bad. Such as that shan't cut or bruise us, nor break our bones. Just give us bad dreams. He took a hearty gulp of the dwarven ale in his costrel, as did several others a moment later. Then the sergeant asked, Ready? And after a smattering of eyes, they reformed their body. The only regiment to move among the attackers were the Brabanzon longbowmen, seeking an opportunity to shoot. The dwarven crossbowmen already had a target and sent a storm of bolts at the slaughtermaster. These clattered upon the stone all around him and even struck his body, but some magical ward he possessed thwarted those few that otherwise might have cut into him. He grinned, revealing his maw of splintered teeth and bloody gums, and reached out to pluck a bolt from the mortar it had embedded itself in, thinking it might serve well as a toothpick. But then his eyes widened as he noticed the black shape of a round shot skipping towards him. If he hadn't already moved to grab the bolt, the ball would have hit him square on. Instead, it brushed past his arm to leave a large black bruise. Below Granite Breaker's muzzle, one of the matrosses reached aloft to tip the wooden container holding the iron ball and sent it rolling down to join the two already inside. The crew did not bother to wad or ram the shops home, to do so would take another half an hour but instead moved away from the front and cupped their hands over their ears. Their thumbs splayed out at the back so as to relieve the pressure that was about to shudder its way through their heads. The chief gunner dipped his extra long linstock so his mate could blow on the coals, then swung it up and over to lower the glowing end of the match down onto the line of slightly slower burning powder he had trailed behind the mound of more excitable powder directly upon the touch hole. This gave him just enough time to turn and hurtled down the steps of his platform. The resultant boom was no more nor less loud than its previous efforts, and yet all those before and within the walls still found themselves shocked. The trio of balls missed the stone defences, travelling through one of the breaches Granite Breaker had already made, and ploughed several hundred yards into the city, collapsing several houses and punching through many more walls. Unfortunately, the great gun's blast had come at a very inopportune moment for the trebuchet's Brabanzon crew. Two had been winding tension into the tautly coiled rope. Another was nursing the catch to hold the winder in place as the rods were removed and replaced to tighten some more. And a fourth, now that the basket was low enough to do so, had begun adding rocks. Who flinched, or slipped, or let go, no one knows. But the resultant premature release wrecked the machine, killed two crewmen, and wounded the third. 
The dwarven longbeards, commanded by the runesmith Ratrick Bronzebourne, had already begun to move towards the city wall when the ogre relief from Sermiday arrived upon the field, consisting of a company of bulls and a mob of goblins. Lord Narhak had expected them, and so he was ready. He, his warriors and his army standard-bearer, the long-bearded veteran Thane Bragdebreg, had tarried as the long-beards moved away, and so now stood directly in the ogre's way. The lead belchers inside the city, reassured by the fact that Granite Breaker had failed even to chip the defences, and happy to pretend they had not witnessed what its shot had done to the dwellings inside the walls, now ascended onto the parapet, there to be joined by the slaughtermaster Wurgrut. To their left, the man-eaters edged forwards through the rubble, all the better to snipe at the foe using their handgun-sized pistols, while the lead belchers, who had descended from the southern wall, now moved out into the shadow of the corner tower. Wurgrut, having spotted the arrival of the first relief force, now attempted to crush the bones of the dwarven thunderers close to the newcomers. But although his spell was cast, it did little more than make the enemy bones ache, while the energies that spilled from his over-hasty efforts stung him and the lead belchers at his side, and sloughed away what other energies the winds of magic could have provided for both him and his lieutenant. He cursed, partly at the pain of the injury he had received, partly at the frustration of fumbling his magical efforts, but mainly because cursing was his most common form of utterance. Only momentarily distracted by their comrade's wound, the lead belchers on the wall, with Wurgrut, blasted their barrels at the advancing longbeards, cutting four down. Their success drew the man-eaters and other lead belchers' interest, so that they too gave fire upon the same regiment, but, despite spewing great plumes of smoke, they failed to harm any more of the enemy. Rackrick Bronzebourne took a puff on his pipe and uttered a single, entirely unnecessary word. Steady! The ragged mob of goblins drew close enough to hurl a varied collection of sharp missiles at the dwarven handgunners, killing one. While they whooped and squealed, the dwarves calmly continued making their pieces ready. Lord Nahak now ordered his warriors to march on, towards the ogres. This was no charge, but rather an attempt to ensure the bulls could not slip past the warriors while the goblins caused a distraction. Slowly but surely, the dwarves moved, so that the only way either the goblins or ogres could get to the artillery pieces in the rear was to go through them. One amongst the warriors, a drummer named Ring Gregor, beat the steady call required for his manoeuvre while staring wide-eyed at the massive brutes ahead. He had been recruited fresh for this campaign and had never seen battle before, apart from the occasional drunken brawl in the alehouses and the halls he entertained in. He did not know it, but Lord Narhak had noticed his expression, recognising the trepidation it revealed. Even as the brute foe began their charge, Lord Narhak leaned towards the drummer and said, Tough audience! Ring Gregor might have laughed had he had the time to do so. Glamourscale the wizard, standing between the quarrellers and the stone-filled gabions shielding Granite Breaker's crew, could see what was happening on the left flank. Having his most important books at hand and tasseled bookmarks handily placed, he opened to a richly adorned page containing the bound spell Harmonic Convergence. With little more than a stroke and a word of command, he released the spell and so blessed the warriors for the fight ahead. Emboldened by this success, he turned to a much trickier page, for the spell there was described but not bound. He had studied this page deep into the night, and now read it aloud, hoping to call down a comet from the heavens. For a moment, he thought it had worked, but then he sensed the unlacing of the etheric winds by the enemy's magicians, and the possibility was gone. He closed the book, but, in hope, left the bookmark in its place. While the Thunderers arguably wasted good powder killing four goblins, one of the bolt-throwers injured a lead belcher, while shots from the smaller cannons tore a bull in half and felled another lead belcher. Granite Breaker struck the last standing section of wall to visibly shake both it and the ogres upon it, which is why Wurgrut accompanied the lead belchers off the wall to stand boldly upon the outside. Now that the relief had begun to arrive, the garrison's slaughtermaster general did not intend to sit inside the walls while they were torn apart just like the last time. Ahead of him, the other company of lead belchers had already ventured some distance out, while to the other side the man-eaters and bulls had also emerged from the ruinous walls. As all these ogres came on, the relief force had already charged. 
the bull smashed hard into the steel-clad dwarf warriors. Beside them, the goblins poured onto the much smaller body of dwarven thunderers, leaving five dead from the dwarves' countershot. Neither slaughtermaster could find it in themselves to summon sufficient magical energies to do their bidding, and so it was left to the lead belchers to fell another pair of longbeards. The combats, unsurprisingly, were considerably messier than the shooting. Two dwarven warriors were fatally crushed by the mere impact of the bulls. Then the ogre's clubs broke the neck of another. Lord Narhak viciously blooded the crusher in command of the bulls, causing him to reel away in pain, while Thane Bragdebreg and the other warriors also carved deep wounds. The bulls, more confused than fearful, found themselves unexpectedly halted. They would need to do a lot more to break through than they had first thought. The goblins failed even to scratch their tough-skinned, armoured foe, while the dwarves dispatched four of the greenskins. Perhaps because the bulls were still fighting at their side, and despite their usual cowardice, they too managed to fight on. This they immediately regretted, for the surviving longbeards now charged into their flank. Knowing that Baron Garroy was watching the army's side from a little way behind them, the Brabanzon riders now spurred their mounts to carry them, within bowshot distance of the bulls, coming very close to the ruinous walls to do so. Both slaughtermasters had spotted Perrette amongst the Brabanzon foot soldiers, and both remembered the fire magic she had employed during the first assault. Keen to avoid such casualties during this last desperate sally from the walls, both chose to ignore Glamour Scale and concentrate on thwarting whatever magic she intended to summon. Thus it was that the dwarf wizard managed once again to settle a harmonic convergence onto the dwarf warriors, magically blessing their blade work. Perrette failed to conjure anything at all, so the ogre's caution was wasted. The attacker's shooting, however, was quite impressive. One bolt killed a bull, another tore deep into the chief slaughtermaster, Wurgrut, one of the cannons took down a man-eater, while Granite Breaker felled another. The dwarven crossbows killed a third. Even the Brabazon riders stuck a few arrows into the enemy. All this damage left only one man-eater, two bulls and the second slaughtermaster in the centre of the field. To the disappointment of its crew, who had become momentarily excited about joining in the fun, the mercenary's light gun merely buried its ball in the dirt. The dwarves now hacked the goblins apart. When the last few greenskins fled in terror, both dwarven regiments followed to finish them off and hit the bull's flank. A bloodbath ensued as Lord Narhak knocked the crusher's brains out, Bragda Bregg killed a bull by himself and two more bulls were slain by the rest. Such was their prowess, luck and the skill of their shield wall that not one dwarf was harmed in this closing part of the fight. The few surviving bulls knew full well to remain would be suicide and so attempted to flee. They were pursued from the field by the longbeards. The threat from Sermidae had been dealt with. The threat from Buldeo had yet to arrive. That second relief force arrived just as the last Sermidan brute was chased away. This new force had no goblins accompanying them, consisting only of brute bull warriors with a bruiser in command. Like many ogre regiments of Border Prince's origins, they wore spiked helmets and gut plates, carrying huge swords in one hand, while their other hands were enclosed in bladed gauntlets of steel. The bruiser had horns sprouting from both his gut plate and helmet, and he bore two weapons, an ugly hooked blade and a very hefty iron club adorned with seven conical barbs. He led his company boldly onto the field as if there were nothing at all to fear. The ogre's arrival was so sudden and they moved so quickly that the young Baron Garroy and his knights, despite waiting with intent for just this occurrence, were taken by surprise and found themselves unable to deliver their anticipated charge. It did not go unnoticed amongst several knights that the Baron had hesitated, if only for the merest moment, and so failed to deliver a prompt enough command. The knights were now forced to turn about if they were to get to grips with the foe. One brute on the Buldean's right flank was shouting something that none among the Brabanson could understand. When he was answered in the same alien tongue, by a shout from the second slaughtermaster with the last surviving garrison bulls, the soldiers knew exactly what was intended. Both ogre companies would coordinate their charges to hit the Brabanzon spear-armed foot soldiers from two sides at the same time. 
The spearmen were the only real fighting body on that flank, apart from the momentarily disoriented knights, for all else were archers and the like. Upon the far right of the ogre's line, the lead belchers who had first emerged from the defences, despite having noticed the sparsity of surviving ogres elsewhere before the walls, and as yet unaware that the Buldean relief force had arrived, finally decided to risk a charge at the reformed dwarven handgunners. Their effort, however, was somewhat half-hearted, as if they merely wanted to appear willing before they looked instead to their own survival. And as soon as one of them fell to the dwarves' perfectly executed volley, they turned and fled from the field and the city. Their initial, apparently aggressive movement was noticed, however, and spurred the lone surviving man-eater and slaughtermaster with the bulls to have a go too. Neither managed to reach the enemy, instead slowing to a halt as they saw the unexpected flight of the lead belchers to their right. Wergrut was sufficiently flustered by what was unfolding before him that he fumbled his attempts at summoning a magical moor, losing control of his creation to harm only himself and his own ogres. Too distracted by the newcomers, the Brabanzon failed to notice the garrison ogre's discomfort. Baron Garoy finally brought his knights about so that they might deliver a charge, while the Brabanzon spearmen manoeuvred similarly so that they might receive one. Perrette had no intention of being caught in the imminent, deadly mayhem, so she glanced around looking for somewhere safer to be. Spotting the brigand archers in the rear, she ran towards them. They were the sort of troops who could move quickly, avoiding trouble, which was exactly what she intended herself. She came to a halt between them and a basket-carrying mule and immediately set about attempting magic. But her desperate dash had left her distracted too and her spells failed to manifest materially. Bolt, bullet and arrow, both large and small, now came bursting from almost every part of the army of Carrick Borgo. Granite Breaker's mighty shot caused the last man-eater to vanish in a red haze and another lead belcher fell dead but much of the shooting was panicked and o'er hasty, especially from the Brabanzon, so that only two of the Buldian brutes fell. Brabanzon horsemen's volley also had little noticeable effect, and they now became onlookers from their somewhat removed position before the ragged walls, watching as the Buldian brutes smashed into the front of the Brabanzon spearmen, while the second slaughtermaster with the last bull hit them in the flank. The Brabanzon foot soldiers were of good reputation, at least when it came to battle, if not for restraint when it came to plunder and pillage. Every man was a veteran of at least one war, and they were led by no less than their company's commander, Captain Lodar the Wolf, with Jean de Salle, the company ensign, by his side. Yet despite all this, despite bracing themselves and presenting a neatly serried array of spear tips, they were not to prevail. Five died from the mere shock of the brute's impact, before even one blade had struck a blow. Captain Lodar was hewn obliquely in two, from left shoulder to right waist, and six more soldiers were similarly butchered, so smashed and shattered with the remainder that they broke immediately. When the brutes came on, they cut down and crushed umpteen more, so that the fighting heart of the Brabanzon, as well as their leaders, were gone. The Buldian brutes' pace had hardly been slowed by this butchery, and they crashed into the dwarven crew of one of the bolt throwers. The startled dwarfs were not so surprised, however, that they failed to realise that this would be their last moment in this world. At last, Baron Garoy and his companions got to deliver the charge they had been yearning for, into the rear of the ogres. Baron Garoy himself took on the bruiser, glad of his armour when the ogre's giant club thudded into his shield and arm, bending the first and numbing the other. It was all he could do to stay mounted. One knight's lance struck home and took down a bull. The ogres had quickly slaughtered the dwarven crewmen and all now turned to face Baron Garoy's company. The knight's charge was over, their impetus spent. More than one now wondered whether their only real chance had already passed. Moments before, Perrette had seen an opportunity. The second slaughtermaster and the last garrison bull were before her visible through a momentary gap appearing between the Brabanzon and the dwarves. Having caught her breath and regained her composure, she could put all her mind to the task. The fireball she conjured singed her comrades on its flight, and upon striking, killed the slaughtermaster and sent the last Campagrotten garrison bull stumbling, smoking, choking forwards, only to be riddled 
with bolts from the quarrellers. Some of the bolts' fletchings caught fire as he fell dead. More of the lead belchers with Wurgrup fell, while he himself watched in addled fascination as one of Granite Breaker's massive round shots skipped off the ground before him to fly only an inch above his head. He cursed, then cursed again for good measure, and although he could see there was still some sort of fighting going on to the enemy's right, he knew to remain would be madness. He had no intention of dying today. He turned, pushing a lead belcher to the ground to clear the way, and scrabbled over the tumbled masonry back into the city. The Baldian bruiser was grinning as he struck Baron Garroy again, almost exactly as before. This time the Baron's arm broke, and the snapped bone inside dislodged from his shoulder. The force of the blow was too much for any human frame. Dropping his sword, his sight lost to him, he began to tumble from his saddle, but was caught by the man beside him, crying, The Baron is wounded! Another grabbed his lord's reins to lead him away. Away! came another shout, which is exactly what the knights did, with the Baldian brutes pursuing. This left the Baldian bulls somewhat exposed. None of the garrison were to be seen, and the knights were too fast for them to reach. Longbowmen, brigands, horse archers, cannons and a bolt thrower surrounded them. Perrette's next attempt to fireball was of little effect, merely warming the brutes' backsides as they slowed. She now watched as a storm of missiles lashed against the ogres. Two more of the brutes fell dead, leaving only three with the bruiser. The bulls had no real chance of getting to grips with the foe, and they knew it. Any one of the enemy bodies surrounding them could easily move away. Meanwhile, the rest would whittle them down to naught if given the chance. The bruiser growled, hurled his giant club towards the Brabazon's little gun, then ordered his warriors to follow him from the field. They did so, and gladly. Camper Grotta had fallen. This was surely the beginning of the end of the ogre's tyrannical rule of this northern Tylean realm. Razga had not returned home in time. Should he do so now, he would find the dwarves and their mercenaries ready and waiting. Admittedly, the Brabazon had suffered heavily, so that only their lightest troops remained intact, and they had no commander at present to lead them. But the Campagna del Sole was on its way, reputedly with a force greater than the dwarves' entire current army. Considering the ogre forces remaining in the realm of Campagrata were petty in size and scattered, Razga's battered army could not hope to prevail. Perrette found herself in the unusual position of being asked by the brigand archers at her side what they should do now. They had personally witnessed her killing of the ogre shaman, and consequently their opinions concerning her had been transformed. As she pondered, Glamourscale joined her and told them the city had fallen. Their work was nearly done. Just a matter, he said, of collecting your portion of the prize. He didn't need to say any more. The archers ran off towards the city, along with every other Brabazon still standing on the field. And as they clambered over the rubble, their shouts and whoops began to reverberate through the streets. <laughs>